Fifi Nyankuma Mesum no a different from the God in the Bible. Lo. Sir? Yes. How? Or a consistent. The God in the Bible is the most inconsistent God I have seen in my life. Hey! A modu. A modu. Masa. The God in the Bible, the Bible tells us that this God is an all knowing God. Only mm -hmm. He's a sovereign God. Mm -hmm. Nothing goes above him. Mm -hmm. He knows every single thing. The Bible tells me that even before I was, war, I was born, mm -hmm. he knew the number of hair in my head. Fifi, any small God you are talking about too. But at the same time, no, the same Bible will tell me of a God who, for example, or instructed Saul to go and kill the Amalekites or whatever. Mm. And that same God comes and says, I regret that I made Saul king. Why are you confused me now? Mm. Because mm. the God that I know doesn't mm. regret. Yeah. He knows all things. Mm -hmm. So God would have known that someone may catch his soul on yet. And yes, I say, we may catch his soul on me. So be an ass on yet. No one, yeah. I can say, ah, my new God doesn't regret. These are the simple things I talk about too. God is not the God of Oma, oh, regret is in me, say. No. Because he knew way in advance. Mm -hmm. So it says here, God told Abraham, Kukum Isaac, now found a sacrifice, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now the Bible says that God was testing Abraham, say, And I'm saying that no. The God that mm. the Bible has spoken to me about you know, knows everything. Yeah. So that God didn't have to test Abraham. And know yes, our God in our back off. No. So that is my problem. That the the the, 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 the inconsistency of God in the Bible boggles my mind and it worries me. Would you disown me, Abba Bedadai? Yes. Hello, this is Pastor Gideon. If you are interested in the Word of God, you are in the right place. Welcome to Kingdom Matters, where we talk about issues that affect our kingdom that are making rounds. So KSM, a respectable comedian in Ghana, has made some weird assertions against the Bible and the God of the Bible, and we want to look at them. He didn't just start today. He has been talking about it for some time now, and I think it's about time he got answered. In the first part of this video, we will look at his claim that the God of the Bible is the most inconsistent God he has seen. He didn't just say that, but also he gave some examples. So we are going to look at his examples too. Then we will do a second video. And in that video, we will look at his claim that the God of the New Testament is not the same as the one of the Old Testament. Then we will do a final video, if God permits. And we will look at his claim that the Bible was used by the European to deceive and steal from the black man. So today, let's enter into the God of the Bible is the most inconsistent God that he knows or he has seen. I think if anyone also has the same view as KSM, I have some few questions for you before we even get to answer your objections. If he says the God of the Bible is the most inconsistent God he has seen, I want to know, number one, how many gods he knows. Number two, what does the consistency of a God look like? And finally, on what ground does he think his assertion on the God of the Bible is right? Example, I haven't studied medicine, so I cannot make conclusions in regards to medical matters. I need specialized knowledge, and that is how the Bible is. The Bible is also a specialized field. You can't just get up and read something with layman's idea and just spit what you think. You need to have studied something. So, does he claim to have some rich biblical studies or biblical background for which reason he's making these assertions i don't know whether you get it yeah so these are the three questions i want anybody who has this view also to try to answer how many gods does he know what does the consistency of a god is like so that if the bible god or the god of the bible is not consistent he will be able to say by this measure he is not being consistent now let's go into answering the video for me before i begin to even answer i think he was being too absolute and conclusive in his remarks concerning the god of the bible and that is very very not good i don't want to say very bad not good 
because he was thinking that whatever he's saying is all there is but that is not all there is they are equally educated men and women who are christians and i've read those same passages and they understand them so if anything the posture of an inquirer or somebody who is not cool with it should be one that is with humility trying to find out so it could be something like from what i have observed from the bible from my side i think something is not consistent with the god of the bible so if somebody can help that is it but for him to claim that the god of the bible is inconsistent looking at this in abraham isaac saul and the amalekites that is not fair even to start with because as we get into the matter you realize that he is very very wrong now let's get into answering his objections if god is all-knowing and is not a man to lie or repent how is it that the bible in many places says he regretted or he repented for some actions and failures of men because he knows all things so he shouldn't be surprised when men do wrong right it means that the god of the bible doesn't know all things right that is what conclusion he came at especially looking at first samuel 15 11 and looking at genesis chapter 6 verse 5 to 6 when men became wicked and genesis 22 when he said i now know that abraham fears me now this topic comes under biblical hermeneutics if you don't have this as a background you may conclude a lot of things wrongly as you read the bible example not all books of the bible are to be read and understood the same way i hope you know this when you read proverbs the approach and the way to which you attack the book is not the same as even reading psalms and it's also not the same way as in reading revelations they are of a different genre so we read and approach them differently in revelation you will see a lot of symbols you see a lot of things you don't interpret them literally the same with psalms it is being written in a certain form and proverbs is coming with a certain poetic um nature so you need to understand even the genre you are reading first then even besides or beyond the genre you need to understand the literal devices that have been employed in a particular context yes when you read it you need to understand what is going on there taking everything literal will end you up in endless confusion and that is why i believe ksm is making all these mistakes he's reading everything literal and he's making his conclusions based on the way he's reading them and that should not be because he is in the art space he's a recognizable man in the art space he's done a lot of things that has got to do with literature so he should have understood this better but unfortunately i don't know why he's not getting it now let's start one after the other in the bible you will find different literary devices you will find the use of simile permit me to be defining them briefly a simile is a comparison between two things usually introduced by the words as or like so in first peter chapter 2 verse 25 the bible says for you were strained like sheep like sheep but have now returned to the shepherds and overseer of your souls does it mean the christian is a sheep no that is simile now if somebody reads it they say the bible says christians are sheep so the bible is wrong you see the problem there just because you didn't get the figure of speech you miss it now let's go on there is also the use of metaphor metaphor is an implied comparison of two things so for example the bible says you are the salt of the earth you are the light of the world does it mean we are salt no we are not salt. we have nothing to do with salt but then the message is carrying is about the usefulness of salt and the usefulness of a christian there is also the use of hyperbole hyperbole is a deliberate exaggeration for emphasis for example when you read matthew chapter 5 29 to 30 the bible says if your right eye causes you to sin tear it out and throw it away for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell do you see christians plugging out their eyes today because their eyes are making them sin it's because it is hyperbole so when you read it you understand that it's not talking about literally plugging out your eyes or cutting your arms or removing your ears no because they make you to sin no he's talking about how to not let a member of your body cause you to sin it's as important as that and also how you do not let one thing prevent you from knowing god and working with god or fulfilling god's purpose for your life it's as simple as that this is called hyperbole you will see this a number of times in the bible deuteronomy 128 look at what the bible says it says where are we going up 
Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. Now the Apaboli will come. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim are there. Now, do you see any wall up to heaven? This is Hannah Pablo. It's just to create an exaggeration, to let them know and have a feeling of how the how strong and tall the wall is. It's as simple as that. Now let's come to the figure of speech that is confusing case, and it is anthropomorphism. This is in literature. Anthropomorphism is a literal device used of human terms to describe a thing about God. Now it's not just about God, anything that is not material but then it is given or human but it's given human characteristic is anthropomorphism do you get it now you need to know that god is incorporeal this means that god has no material form or physical substance did you know that yes god is immaterial he is non-physical it also means god transcends matter and energy he is not a man he is a spirit so to deal or relate with man he will have to come to man's level since man can't get to his level in the same light man cannot understand who an infinite god actually is unless it is brought down to his level god is way beyond the scope of our imagination and vocabulary except that who he is and his ideas are captured in human terms or in ways men can understand we will not be able to know or relate with god so what God does to help man capture who he is and what he says is done in inspiration. When we say all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now, in inspiration, what God does is that he works confluently in, with, and by the writers. By elevating them, directing them, controlling them, and energizing them so that as his instruments, they rise above themselves. And under his inspiration to capture in human terms and the literary styles and skills available to the writers his ideas that he wants them to have so it is subject to their literary styles and human ideas and terms the question is does god speak our kind of flawed early language no of course not he is a perfect god do you get it in working confluently with man he uses their vocabulary culture and experiences to capture who he is and his messages remember man can only write as much as he knows and can relay with so when man writes about god in human terms it is anthropomorphism it is not exactly what god is because god is infinite he's way higher but to bring it to human terms so that we can relay with him that is why we have this 40 language and 40 image of god it's not perfect so the bible said now we see him through a glass darkly but face to face we shall see him as he is now the way we see god is just through human language human terms and it is not able to capture exactly what god is like let me give you examples of this in first peter chapter 3 verse 12 the bible says for the eyes of the lord are over the righteous and his ears open unto their prayers but the face of the lord is against them that do evil so you see eyes ears and face now this is anthropomorphisms the first one here is the eyes of the lord does it mean god has eyeballs that are roaming and looking with eyes no it is a literal device you don't take it literally it is metaphoric you see god is not material being he is not a human being he is a spirit god doesn't need eyes to see god sees all things at the same time from present to the future so when you see the bible say god has eyes his eyes are watching or god has ears is listening god has face his face is upon the uh, or against the wicked it doesn't mean god is using eyeballs and ears and face no it is the same way when you say God has regretted or repented or felt sorry. It's not saying that God has discovered a new information and so he feels bad for making a wrong decision or God made a wrong decision and so he is repenting or regretting. No, God doesn't discover new information. He knows all things. It is also not as a result of a wrong decision made by God. God's ways are perfect. The reason why you see regretted, repented is that God is a personal God. 
that is the best human expression to capture the love and high regard god has for man when he disappoints him so let's come to let's say genesis chapter 6 verses where the bible says it repented the lord that he had made man on the earth if you understand what we said so far it will begin to make sense to you when you go to ephesians 1 verse 3 and 4 the bible says Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And verse 4 says, According as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So you see that God selected us. He saved us. He prepared us even before the foundation of the world to save us. He is not planning today. Salvation is not an afterthought he knew that when he brings man on earth man is going to sin and he already planned salvation ahead do you get it so the cross of jesus christ the death of jesus was not an afterthought god in his omniscience prepared our salvation even before the world began because he knew well that there will be a fall in second timothy chapter 1 verse 9 the bible says who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ before the world began. So your purpose on earth here, it was given to you in Christ before the world began. God is omniscient. He dealt with everything that was going to come with the fall and prepared our salvation in Christ way before we arrived here. Do you get it? So when it is said that God has repented, just know that it is not an expression in human terms to show that God has empathy for man in their wrong ways and in their wrong decision. And if he feels it because he's a personal God, a God that is relatable. But do you know, even when we say God feels it, it is just a human way to show that God can relate with our failures. But technically, God doesn't have feelings. Yes, he doesn't have feelings like we think of feelings because he is a spirit and not a material being. So he can relate with it, but he is not a physical being. He doesn't have flesh to have feelings like we do have feelings. Do you get it? Let's now descend a step further into his examples, some of his examples. When the Bible says God repents or regret, as in the case of Saul, the Hebrew word is nakam, and it means being sorry about something. Now, this expression is used mostly when men fail God. And when that happens, God is said to be disappointed. That is what many confuse with the knowledge of God. And they say God didn't know it. That's why he is disappointed. No. God knows everything. He knows how things are going to play out. He knows how things are going to end. But then, as a personal God who loves his creation and his children and wants to relate with them, he can feel, he can feel the disappointment. He can feel um the failure that is happening in man's life so they say god didn't know it if he knew it he wouldn't be regretting but that is very far from the truth like the lord jesus said in matthew 22 29 you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of god generally when men repent or they regret is based off like the discovery of a new information or a wrong decision that they just realize but god knows all things and all his decisions and ways are perfect 2 Samuel 22, 31 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The work of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. Do you get it? Isaiah 46, 9 to 10 says, Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient time the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God knows the end from the beginning. 1 John 3.20 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. So why does the Bible use repent and regret for God? If he doesn't make mistakes and does not discover new information. I told you, it is an expression in human terms to show that God has empathy for man in their wrong ways and in their wrong decisions. And he feels it because he's a personal God. In human terms, another example is like a, a mother or a father watching their child learn how to walk. You know definitely they are going to fall. But then you allow them go through the process and you watch them and you feel the empathy when they fall it is a real feeling you can really relate that they are falling they are getting hurt but you have to allow them go through the process that is a human way of likening when god repents or god feels sorry about a situation to what human beings feel but like we said god doesn't have that kind of feeling but he can relate with us and that is how human way of relating 
to what God does or feel is like. When you read in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, We have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Do you get it? That is what God has sought to establish with man. Also, in the places where God says something, then he is said to have repented. Like the case of Moses, when he said he will wipe everybody out and start with Moses, a new family, a new generation. And even in the case of Jonah and Nineveh, when it is said that um, God repented from what he wanted to do in Nineveh. Listen, even Jonah knew Nineveh would change if he preaches to them. And God will be gracious to them. So he said he won't go. Actually, that is the main reason why Jonah was running away from God. Because he knows that people will change. God will not destroy them. And he will become a liar or the third party or the third person in this case. So he didn't want to go. Jonah chapter 4, 1 to 2. But it pleased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord. Was not this my say when I was here in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tashes, for I knew that you are a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repented thee of the evil. Have you seen it? God is a just God and judges sin. When he wants to judge sin, he will go straight and judge it. But when you see God um, telling somebody about it, so that they begin to pray like the way Moses is praying, or he sends a messenger to go and talk to the people about it, that is God trying to seek repentance or see somebody pray, stand in the gap. And I said, just God and a prayer answering God for him to intervene so that the destruction doesn't come. It is after he has said that if the people don't change or nothing is done, then he will go ahead. But if he wanted to do, he would have stand, he would have just gone ahead and executed the judgment. And finally, on Abraham, why does God say, now I know you love me? Did God just discover that Abraham is a faithful servant to him? No! When God says to Abraham, now on, I know you fear me, it is anthropomorphism. God knew all the way. He did know in Genesis chapter 18, even before the temptation in Genesis 22. In Genesis 18, 18 and 19, look at what God said to Abraham. He said, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, listen, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. He said, I know Abraham, he will command his children, I know him. So what happened in Genesis 22, and God saying that, um, now I know you fear me. That is a human way of making it clear to Abraham that he is approved of him. When he says, I go down to Sodom and Gomorrah to verify their sins, it is anthropomorphic. God doesn't need to move or see something to know what is happening. He knows all things. So when you see a mixture of the character of God and the use of human terms to express something about God, don't be in a hasty to say, ah, this God, he knows all things here, but here he doesn't know all things. Listen, it is just the use of a literal device and miss the full character of God. And that's why sometimes it brings confusion to the unlearned mind. God bless you. I'll see you in the next video where I answer the other objections that they have. I believe you are blessed. So the next time you see human terms being used for God, understand and know this word, anthropomorphism. God bless you. Have a beautiful time. See you next in the next video. Shalom.